Mr. President. Senator from Utah. Mr. President, fear has become an all too prevalent quality in American political discourse. And unfortunately, fear is unavoidable. When debating the substance of the resolution before this body today, that is climate change, socialism, and the Green New Deal. On entering this debate, I have a little fear in my heart as well. But Mr. President, my fear at this moment may be just a little different than that of some of my colleagues. Unlike some of my colleagues, I'm not immediately afraid of what carbon emissions unaddressed might do to our environment in the near-term future, or our civilization, or our planet in the next few years. Unlike others, I'm not immediately afraid of what the Green New Deal would do to our economy and our government. After all, this isn't going to pass. Not today, not anytime soon, certainly. Rather, after reading the Green New Deal, I'm mostly afraid of not being able to get through this speech with a straight face. For Mr. President, I rise today to consider the Green New Deal with the seriousness it deserves. This is, of course, a picture of former President Ronald Reagan uh, naturally firing a, a machine gun while riding on the back of a dinosaur. You'll notice a couple of important features here. Uh, first of all, uh, the rocket launcher uh, strapped to President Reagan's back. And then the stirring, unmistakable patriotism of the velociraptor holding up a tattered American flag, a symbol of all it means to be an American. Now, critics might quibble with this depiction of the climactic battle of the Cold War, because while awesome, in real life, there was no climactic battle. There was no battle with or without velociraptors. The Cold War, as we all know, was won without firing a shot. But that quibble actually serves our purposes here today, Mr. President, because this image has as much to do with overcoming communism in the 20th century as the Green New Deal has to do with overcoming climate change in the 21st. The aspirations of the proposal have been called radical. They've been called extreme. But mostly, they're ridiculous. There isn't a single serious idea here, not one. To illustrate, let me highlight two of the most prominent goals produced by the plan's authors. Goal number one, the Green New Deal calls essentially for the elimination of airplanes. Now this might seem merely ambitious for politicians who represent the densely populated northeastern United States. But how is it supposed to work for our fellow citizens who don't live somewhere between Washington, D.C. and Boston? In a future without air travel, how are we supposed to get around the vast expanses of, say, Alaska during the winter? Well, I'll tell you how. Tauntauns, Mr. President. This is a beloved species of repto mammals native to the ice planet of Hoth. Now, while perhaps not as efficient in some ways uh, as airplanes or as snowmobiles, these hairy bipedal species of space lizards offer their own unique benefits. Not only are tauntauns carbon neutral, but according to a report a long time ago and issued far, far away, they may even be fully recyclable and usable for their warmth, especially on a cold night. What about Hawaii? Isolated, 2,000 miles out into the Pacific Ocean. Under the Green New Deal's effective airplane prohibition, how are people there supposed to get to and from the mainland? And how are they supposed to maintain that significant portion of their economy that's based on tourism? At that distance, swimming would, of course, be out of the question. And jet skis are notorious gas guzzlers. No, all residents of Hawaii would be left with is this. This 
is a picture of Aquaman, a superhero from the undersea kingdom of Atlantis, and uh, notably here, a founding member of the Super Friends. I draw your attention, Mr. President, to the 20-foot impressive seahorse he's riding. Under the Green New Deal, this is probably Hawaii's best bet. Now, I'm the first to admit that a massive fleet of giant, highly trained seahorses would be cool. It would be really, really awesome. But we have to consider a few things. We have no idea about scalability or domestic capacity in this sector. The last thing we want is to ban all airplanes and only then find out that China or Russia may have already established strategic hippocampus programs designed to cut the United States out of the global market. Mr. President, we must not allow and cannot tolerate a giant seahorse gap. Goal number two. The Green New Deal anticipates the elimination of all cows. Talking points released by the sponsors of the resolution the day it was introduced cited the goal of, quote, fully getting rid of, and I'll paraphrase a little bit here, flatulating cows. Now, Mr. President, I share their concern. But honestly, I think you've got to remember that if they think the cows smell bad, just wait till they get a whiff of the seahorses. But back to the cattle. Uh, I've got a chart to illustrate this trend. As you can see, Mr. President, on the left, these little cows represent the bovine population of America today. On the right is the future population under the Green New Deal. We would go from about 94 million cows to zero cows. No more milk, no more cheese, no more steak, no more hamburgers. Over the state work period last week, I visited some farms to find out for myself what Utah's own bovine community might think of the Green New Deal. Every cow I spoke to said the same thing. Boo. The authors of this proposal will protest that these goals are not actually part of the Green New Deal, but were merely included in supporting documents accidentally sent out by the office of the lead sponsor in the House of Representatives. But, Mr. President, this only makes my point. The supporters of the Green New Deal want Americans to trust them to reorganize our entire society, our entire economy, to restructure our very way of life, when they couldn't even figure out how to send out the right press release. The Green New Deal is not a serious policy document because it's not a policy document at all. It is, in fact, an aesthetic one. The resolution is not an agenda of solutions. It's a token of elite tribal identity and endorsing it a public act of piety for the chic and woke. And on those embarrassing terms, it is already a resounding success. As Speaker Pelosi herself put it, quote, the green dream or whatever they call it, nobody knows what it is, but they're for it, right? Right. Critics will no doubt chastise me for not taking climate change seriously. But please, Mr. President, nothing could be further from the truth. No Utah needs to hear pious lectures about the gravity of climate change from politicians from other states. For it was only in 2016, as viewers of the Sci-Fi Network will well remember, when climate change hit home in Utah, when our own state was struck not simply by a tornado, Mr. President, but by a tornado with sharks in it. These images are from the indispensable documentary film, Sharknado 4. They captured the precise moment when one of the tornado sharks crashed through the window of Utah's governor, Governor Gary Herbert. A true Utah hero and a fine American, 
Governor Herbert, who, by the way, is an incredible athlete and an expert tennis player, Governor Herbert bravely fought the animal off with the tennis racket that he keeps by his desk precisely for occasions such as this. So let's be really clear, Mr. President. Climate change is no joke, but the Green New Deal is a joke. It is the legislative equivalent of Austin Powers' Dr. Evil, demanding sharks with frickin' lasers on their heads. The Green New Deal is not the solution to climate change. It's not even part of the solution. In fact, it's part of the problem. The solution to climate change won't be found in political posturing or virtue signaling like this. It won't be found in the federal government at all. You know where the solution can be found, Mr. President? In churches, in wedding chapels, in maternity wards across the country and around the world. Mr. President, this is the real solution to climate change, babies. Climate change is an engineering problem, not social engineering, but the real kind. It's a challenge of creativity, ingenuity, and most of all, technological innovation. And problems of human imagination are not solved by more laws. They're solved by more humans. More people mean bigger markets for more innovation. More babies will mean forward-looking adults, the sort we need to tackle long-term, large-scale problems. American babies in particular are likely going to be wealthier, better educated, and more conservation-minded than children raised in still industrializing countries. As economist Tyler Cowen recently wrote, on this very point addressing this very topic, quote, by having more children, you're making your nation more populous, thus boosting its capacity to solve climate change, close quote. Finally, Mr. President, children are a mark of the kind of personal, communal, and societal optimism that is the true prerequisite for meeting national and global challenges together. The courage needed to solve climate change is nothing compared with the courage needed to start a family. The true heroes of this story aren't politicians, and they aren't social media activists. They're moms and dads. And the little boys and girls that they are at this very moment, putting down for naps or helping with their homework, building tree houses and teaching them how to tie their shoes. The planet does not need for us to think globally and act locally so much as it needs us to think family and act personally. The solution to climate change is not this unserious resolution that we're considering this week in the Senate, but rather the serious business of human flourishing. The solution to so many of our problems at all times and in all places is to fall in love, get married, and have some kids. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Washington. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise today.